Exploring post-war Appalachia, you'll discover a world full of strange creatures, dark secrets, and many random encounters. In today's video, I'll be going through 10 different things you may have missed, including post-apocalyptic restaurant reviews, evidence of a new ultrasite abomination, and how following in the footsteps of a Union striker sheds new light on the process of becoming a trog. Let's get started. Up first today, we're heading to the pit for the mission Union Dues. Instead of progressing with the mission itself, we're retracing the steps of Pat Gerber, a Union striker. Originally with the local 42 division, he was transferred to the local 29 in the industrial district to undertake a special mission, hunting for a beast. Pat's mission is recounted in four holotapes that can be found throughout the district, two outside and two inside the foundry. Finding all four of these will unlock a little easter egg at the end of the mission, but it also reveals what exactly happened to Pat. The first is found below the warehouse in the Fanatic Supply Depot, where Hex might send you in the mission. Heading down like this, you'll actually find a locked entrance to a pipe, and unlocking it and heading into the end is where you'll find a body with the first holotape sat next to it. Giving it a listen, Pat brings us up to speed. This is Pat Gerber, striker for the Union. Mission log. Taking care of unfinished business. Used to get reports back in the day of something. Some kind of mutant or monster lurking beneath the foundry. Disappearances, attacks, one or two mangled corpses, nasty stuff. Will be a change of pace from rooting out spies and fanatic guerrillas, if indeed it is something new on our plates. The second holotape is also found outside, but this time it's in the shipping container area, inside a damaged building in a back room. It's in the second holotape that Pat learns what exactly he is hunting, once he's headed over to the pen to meet Hex. Pat Gerber, Union Striker, Local 29. Mission lock. In pursuit of a beast. Met up with a new local leader. A woman who goes by Hex. Guess they've had run-ins with the creatures I'm looking for. So there goes my fanatic raider theory. She showed me the body of one of these things. No wonder they had folks running scared. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these troglodytes would put the fear into anybody. I'll only be playing partial elements of the first three holotapes, as it's the fourth that is the most interesting. Heading inside the foundry now, it's time to hunt down the other two. The third one is found near the fire pit at area of the foundry, near a union corpse propped up against a wall. Giving it a lesson actually reveals where the trogs have actually been coming from. Found a way past the patrols and made it to the tunnels beneath the foundry. Place is like a maze. It's no wonder we never scouted the whole thing when we owned this place. And there's evidence of our mutant friends everywhere. Signing off though, Pat is determined to continue despite the hardship. I'm gonna exterminate the whole lot of these creatures. The going is getting tougher. The rads get worse the deeper I go. I can feel my body heating up, my my skin crawling, my damn head starting to swim. Hope the damage isn't done already. The final holotape is found in the belts in the room you can see here, and heading in you'll actually see it on this table. Let's give it a listen. Pretty sure I fucked up good. Got a little farther down and came face to face with my prey. So I was pretty sure I, I was... A goner, but it didn't pounce, didn't strike. The thing just stared, and it, 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 it knew me. I, I, I could feel it. How that's possible, I, I don't know, but sort of chilled down my spine. Its eyes, they called to me, but after a, a minute or two, it, it, just, it just turned around and and left, and so did I. I made it. I made it back topside. But all I feel is... Uh, is an anger. It's swelling up inside me. I'm just so mad. You know, you know, wait for these, these urges to subside. Don't want to hurt anyone. Shouldn't be near other people right now. God. So damn bright up here. You need to find a little corner uh, out of the light. What we actually just heard was a man becoming a trog in real time. And if you manage to find all four of these, then the final stage of the mission will actually be a little bit different. Union dues will always spawn a high level trog enemy as the final quest marker, and defeating it will end the mission. But instead of the usual trog, you get the unique legendary trog striker. And this is actually Pat Gerber in the flesh. His transformation complete. Pat became a trog superior, and although this won't offer up any unique rewards or anything like that, it is a neat little easter egg. 
Pulling Pat out of his misery, it's time to finish on an even more tragic note. Pat, it transpires, actually had a wife called Bella Gerber, and she was a union runner for the union survivors inside the Sanctum. Her story is actually told also in four holotapes, and her fate is arguably even worse. Seeing the fanatics find the Sanctum and becoming a prisoner, awaiting a fate worse than death in her final holotape. I was so arrogant, so stupid. Forgot that I wasn't the only person capable of navigating the trench. It's a nice little reference to the former fanatic Danilo, who's actually our guide in the trench, and was actually responsible for helping the fanatics find the sanctum. But she will also mention Pat for the first time, and her final words sadly would not come to pass. And Pat, if you ever find that monster you were looking for, don't go alone. I think it's fair to say the pit didn't live up to expectations ultimately, but the added lore and little stories like this were a great addition. Leaving the pit behind, let's return to Appalachia to meet another survivor of the Great War. Glenn Ramos, former chef to the pre-war elite, and a disgraced food critic to boot, he wasn't about to let the nukes stop him. Famous for unsuccessfully suing Hornwright Holdings, the parent company of the Rusty Pick, for claiming they used expired Instamash in its famous shepherd's pie, he decided to spend the apocalypse wandering Appalachia's abandoned restaurants and eateries, writing reviews about his experiences pre-war and comparing them to the post-war situation. We can find his reviews in note form at five different locations, rating each experience out of five stars. Starting with the lowest rated, we arrive at Slocum's Joe and give the note Slocum's woes pinned up on the billboard a read. Giving it a measly one star, he laments that if one good thing came out of the apocalypse, it's that he wouldn't have to drink a cup of their coffee again. Stale acidic rubbish he claims is actually worse than the nuclear hellfire. His journey took him to Lady Janet's soft serve next, and his note Damn it Janet is actually found on the counter. A popular trendy teen hangout spot pre-war, Glenn notes that this is actually still popular with hordes of irradiated teens still frequenting it. The lack of ice cream and propensity of alcohol, however, meant it only did one better than Slocum's Joe, coming in at two stars. Red Rocket Please Stop is actually the third note to find at the Red Rocket Truck Stop, and it's an interesting one. Glenn recounts a story about a food critic pal Jerry telling him about a fully automated kitchen that produced the perfect burger. Skeptical until he tried it, he concedes that it was the best burger he ever had, spitting it out quickly though and doing a disgusted face, as he had a reputation to uphold, and that only got three stars. And then there were two. The General Steakhouse is next, a fine dining destination pre-war, Glenn was a fan of the proprietor Milo, but was less of a fan of its clientele. Uppity tech types and Rob Coat, he prefers the new clientele actually, who he describes as being more pleasant, less pompous, despite their shriveled appearance and ravenous lust for his own flesh. The five-star general note can be found at the front, and he gave it four stars. And last but not least, Glenn's travels took him to Big Fred's Barbecue. The only five-star establishment we find burnt ends underneath a battered clipboard on the front desk. One little nugget from the note was the revelation that Big Fred wasn't actually that big at all. And although the readily available new meat sauce was quite good, it didn't compare to what Big Fred's was like. It's unclear what became of Glenn after he wrote these five notes, but perhaps he's still out there traversing the wasteland, trying out new cuisine at old eateries, and leaving more notes for us to find. One of the most striking images in the wasteland, jagged concrete spikes loom out of the ground at Federal Disposal Site HZ-21. At its centre, piles of nuclear waste sit luminescent with radioactivity. Normally home to super mutants and a snallygaster, we can learn more about the spikes in this dumping ground on a terminal located inside the main building. Straight away we see an entry entitled the 10,000 Year Initiative, and split into four parts, these explain in full the design of this disposal site. Starting with the background, we learn that this is actually the first facility in Appalachia to undergo the 10,000 year initiative. A secure location to dispose of waste that will likely take thousands of years to break down and become safe, and it also serves as a warning to potential future inhabitants for this area isn't safe for habitation. What's interesting about all of this though is it's actually inspired by a real world concept. Based on long-term nuclear waste warning messages, it shares a lot of similarities with this concept art called the Landscape of Forms, by Michael Brill and Safdar Abidi. The necessity for such a structure is outlined in the second entry, with languages and methods of communication or storing data changing over time, a different method would need to be used. In methods, we learn that the spikes were meant to convey a sense of danger or harm to anyone who would come across them. And this was phase one. Phase two was adding metal engravings to the perimeter. Sealed and treated to withstand harsh conditions, they would include pictograms to further convey the danger. Finally, in conclusions, they can see they have done all that is humanly possible to warn future generations. Radiation need not be feared, but it must command your respect. Read the posters located in the main building, 
and this method of using symbolism to convey warnings by the structural design is definitely an interesting concept. Not that it mattered in this universe with the Great War radiating pretty much everything. Once home to the nuclear winter game mode, Vault 51 was opened for us in the main game with the Fallout Worlds update. Sure, this one is pretty well known by most, but if you didn't know, then Vault 51 is great to visit if you're hunting down some unique junk items. Although many of the unique items here can be found on their own elsewhere, the fact that so many pristine junk items can be found in one place makes your scavenging trip much easier. To get into Vault 51 at the top of the map, you need to locate this large trailer off to the side. Heading inside into the back, you'll see a button. Pressing this will activate the vault door opening sequence, allowing you to enter the vault and begin exploring. This vault is full of leveled scorch, but immediately you'll notice clean versions of just about everything. Vases, food, coffee mugs and tins, and make sure to check lockers too as you'll find more items in these. But you can also get some very unique items like a restored desk fan, and in the kitchen area you can find pristine coffee tins and much more to loot. You can also find the very rare 308 casing on the landing, and heading backstage in this room you can find discarded instruments. Finishing up the bottom floor, it's time to head into the overseas quarters, and to do this you'll need to find the correct keycard, or you can just photo mode glitch through. Heading inside you'll find an assortment of items on display here, of particular interest though is a set of robot models, but you can also find undamaged Abraxo cleaner and a Wakemaster alarm clock. Of course if you're not looking to leave anything you can just come to this location to discover more about the Vault 51 story, which you can still do through holotapes and terminals. Overall Vault 51 is probably the best single location mode to go for display items or junk in general. There really is so much packed in here. Atomic mining services were initially welcomed into the Appalachia region with open arms. Quickly the public opinion on them though devolved, as their corporate greed and reckless discovery and procurement of Ultasite spelled trouble for the West Virginia locals. To appreciate the full extent of what they were up to, then head over to their headquarters found in Watoga. Looting the AMS basement key from Hellcat Sergeant Kit's office in the missing persons quest from Steel Rain, you'll be able to access the AMS corporate headquarters basement. And inside at the back, there is a very interesting open holding cell. And on a table at the front, a note called Attention Night Crew. We learn that a Subject Zero was stored in the cage. A degloving incident meant power armor found in the room could be used for cleaning duties, and the walls would need to be reinforced, as he clawed at them non-stop. Closing with the line, if he ever gets loose, we're all doomed. So what was this subject? It hardly sounds human. We can learn more about it in the opposite room on a terminal at the back. But this research lab, it transpires, was experimenting with heated ultracite on live subjects. And Specimen Zero was human. The radiation exposure that occurred in animal test subjects also occurred with this unfortunate subject, which experienced total hair loss and significant skin damage. A further triple dose resulted in the loss of brain function and heightened aggression levels. Ultimately, the subject was listed as deceased due to the radiation. It doesn't appear to be a body for us to inspect, but considering the degloving incident and the subject being considered extremely dangerous, it's curious to theorise over what it looked like. Do you think this subject was heavily mutated? Let me know in the comments. Another feature with the Brotherhood questline was the return of an old character with a new identity. Ares is introduced in the questline, out of the blue. Initially a prime suspect in the disappearance of a Blue Ridge caravan, ultimately he was revealed to be innocent. During the mission there are hints throughout, particularly with the arrival of an imposter sheep squatch, but Ares is in fact Calvin Van Lowe. Calvin attempted to fabricate a sheep squatch sighting by reprogramming an assault on with sheep squatch mating rituals. A misinterpretation of the word overwrite for override led to it escaping, maiming Calvin badly, and his location after this was unclear. You can, however, chat with Ares after the mission where he will provide some clarity with details only Calvin would know. You mean the voice, the mask? It's not so much what, but who. And, uh, I think you've already been acquainted. It's my special reward for standing between a robot and love. Love that, a uh, someone may have programmed it to seek out. I do not recall that programming requiring ripping the face off of any human in its path, or running down Bish employees for that matter. But <laughs> isn't Mother Nature amazing? Fallout 76 is filled with interesting characters so you can engage in conversation. The Raiders of Crater are of course no exception, but two in particular are very interesting to chat to when you have a minute, because there may be more than meets the eye. Starting off at Ohio River Adventures, we're seeking out the leader of the Blackwater Bad Boys, a raider named Fishbones. Well spoken, if a little arrogant, he's more than happy to explain his current predicament. See, I started out as part of the original band getting Crater up and running. Proved myself an effective leader in the process. Maybe a little too effective, if you know what I mean. 
He believes he was sent away from Creator because of his potential aptitude as a leader, considering himself a threat. I think they wanted me out of the equation over at Crater. Can't blame them, really. I'd be running the place by now, and they'd be fish food. But most interesting is what he's wearing. Underneath his mismatched armor is clearly a set of Enclave Forest operative under armor. How or why he obtained it is a bit unclear, but considering the remote location we actually find him in, the fanciful stories he will tell us, and his general demeanor, he does kind of stand out from the rest of the gang. Heading over to the creator though itself, another character who is arguably even more interesting is Munch. You can find him in this bungalow here. An older raider, he's pretty friendly, but it'll also provide some interesting thoughts on how the crash space station ended up where it is. Just look around, kid. Good old OC-1 was once a grand space station, sent up on a top secret mission to monitor alien activity here on Earth. In fact, aliens are what brought her down in the first place. They didn't like us trying to spy on them. Claiming that aliens are indeed real, and they were responsible for bringing down the space station is pretty believable, considering everything that we've seen. What is interesting is how he would know that though. He does talk about having his own share of escapades before the war. I had my own share of escapades before the war. Government conspiracies, top secret installations. I was in it, kid. I was in it, kid. Munch might turn out to be just someone obsessed with conspiracy theories with a knack for being right on the money, and Fishbones may end up being just a raider with an enclave fashion sense. But wouldn't it be interesting if there was more to both of these characters? Perhaps even undercover enclave agents, or something of that nature? Leave your thoughts on this pair in the comments. Speaking of aliens though, let's talk about one very special Seaton. The Flatwoods Monster, or Alien Inquisitor as the boss in Daily Ops is now called, is up there with the most powerful entities in Fallout 76. We recently tested one on pretty much everything we could find, controlling living and unliving entities. Your camp ally, turrets and pets, basic enemies, and every exterior boss wasn't safe from its unique controlling ability. Earl was spared from this fate, of course, because the power of the interior cell trumps even the Flatwoods Monster. We got some great visuals and it really cemented my belief that this really is one of the top tier entities in every Fallout game. The ability to control the Scorched creatures in particular really puts into perspective their power. Affected creatures are themselves prey to the powerful Scorched Hive Mind, not that it presented an issue for the Flatless Monster though. One question I did see after that first video was how to actually find these out and about, so let's run through that very quickly. The method I used to guarantee that you get one to spawn revolves around the daily quest Queen of the Hunt. Tasked with investigating a couple of sites in search of a random cryptid, you will likely need to reset this multiple times by simply heading back to the main menu and reloading. As long as you don't complete the quest, each site will reset when you load back in, and doing this enough times eventually a flatless monster will spawn. Once you are successful, a really cool detail is that this particular flatless monster is relentless. I haven't tested this yet on the other random spawns, but the Queen of the Hunt cryptid will literally chase you across the map, and unlike other enemies, its teleporting ability will allow it to close a distance with ease. So yeah, if you want to take photos with it or drag it to a particular location, then this one is your best bet. Something I'm yet to test this on though is Fallout 76's most recent addition, the Smiling Man. Injured Cold has probably introduced himself to most of the wasteland at this point, but here's a refresher if you haven't had the pleasure. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. At least, not yet. I've heard the moon can be Baloo, and I trust that to be true. Ever dance with the devil under a blue moon? Clearly teasing whatever is coming in June. Once in a blue moon. He will actually also say this outright, but I did miss in a previous video. The devil lies. In the details. Or so I have heard. I have yet to meet a devil. A rare occurrence, it would seem. Once in a blue moon, the locals say. But focusing on that tease and terminology for a second, and taken in conjunction with some illustrations from the scoreboard, and a random encounter Stephen Scarberry potentially had in the wasteland, the devil he mentions may be referring to something else. And taking a closer look at the scoreboard, the creature this actually most closely resembles is the Jersey Devil. A creature native to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, it is often described as having hooves, a snake's tail, bat wings, and a head that looks something like a horse or a goat. While there have been many stories detailing the origin of the Jersey Devil, sightings have been reported beginning in the 1700s and continuing on until the past decade. Its name has often been attributed to a great many cryptid sightings throughout the region, and of course Stephen does tell a random encounter story about this creature, which at first I thought surely referred to a scorch beast. I heard the majestic sound of wings flapping in the night, but then I saw the red-winged creature and there was screaming, 
However, after reading a little bit more about the Jersey Devil, one attributing factor is a loud scream. It's supposedly emitted in some sightings. It also is often described as having red wings. The Scorch Beast itself could be a reference to this, as it too is pretty noisy in combat and can seem dragon-like. Perhaps the Devil the Smiling Man refers to is this, a new type of cryptid that will appear once in a blue moon. We do have the bare bones of a new creature atop Seneca Rocks already, and considering the changes made to cryptids in Fallout 76, could this vulture be a stand-in for the Jersey Devil of Legend? Whatever the case, I'm looking forward to learning the truth behind these various teasers and hints that have been dropping recently. What do you think the June update will actually bring though? Will we actually dance with a Jersey Devil under a blue moon? Let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed these roughly 10-ish lore discoveries. If you enjoyed this particular video, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. To close out March, we have our second monthly camp showcase releasing very soon, alongside more Fallout 76 content, so turning on the bell icon is definitely the best way to stay up to date. With that said, I'm off. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.